Alrighty, there we go. Give it a few more seconds. Um, yeah, welcome everyone. Uh, there's a little, right down in the bottom, there's a chat section. So I don't know if anyone wants to just let us know where you are tuning in from. It's always lovely to see where, where people are saying, well, people are coming in from. So mm. just let us know where you are from. There we go. Oh, one from Iran. There we go. <laughs> oh, Iran. No way. How's it? Yes, I was I was in Iraq the other day, so it's yeah, Just in the Gulf. Next door. <laughs> Why can't I I can't ask questions. No, you. Oh, you can. Yes, you can. Oh, can I in the chat? Oh, someone yeah. from ne ne Remy from Netherlands, Annie from Sweden, but Joburg. Oh, there we go. There you are. <laughs> oh, lekker, Josie. Hello, Pete. How are you doing? <laughs> From the Grand Canyon. Oh, Mr. Eastwood. Yeah, we were just talking about you. How are you, sir? <laughs> uh, there we go. From Turkey, UK. This Great. is amazing. My, my cousin's <laughs> also here from Cape Town. <laughs> hey, Larissa. There we go. <laughs> That's so cool. Um, yeah, so we are live on Facebook as well. Um, so I just wanted to welcome everyone here tonight. Um, this is our fourth wild webinar of the year. And we are very excited to be speaking to Dr. Ben Miller from Wildscapes Veterinary and Conservation Services. Um, yeah, Ben, thank you so much for, for coming on board. And I know you've had a very hectic schedule over the last couple of days. So yeah, I really, really appreciate you making the time to come and chat to us and to everyone around the world. I mean, we've had a phenomenal response to everything. So it's I'm very excited to hear more about the work you do. Um, I'm gonna hand over to you just now, but I just wanted to go through a few of the, the not rules, or some of the procedures or whatever. <laughs> so um, for anyone that doesn't know me, my name's Carla Heiser. I am the founder and owner of the Blue Sky Society Trust. So I normally raise money and awareness for various conservation projects through expeditions into Africa. Sadly, with COVID um, in the last year, um, had to come up with another plan. That's why we started creating these little wild webinars, because it's very important for these conservation groups to tell their stories and to try and raise a little bit of money for them wherever we possibly can. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to just chat to Ben. He's going to tell us a story. He's going to tell us some exciting stories and about um, some of the, the, the projects that he has to deal with on a daily basis. Um, in the bottom, you can see there's a QA and a um, button. So if anyone's got any questions or anything that they would like to write or well, ask Ben, then Erin is going to, at the end of our conversation, um, answer the question. So we're going to try and keep it to about 30, 35 minutes, because I know everybody out there has got um, things to go and do. Um, and then also just to let you know that we are recording this and yeah, we'll put it up on Facebook or if you want to get a copy, you can just email me. Um, yeah, Ben, as I say, thank you so much. Um, it's, it's, I've known you, I think I met you the first time we worked together was in 2017. Um, but yeah, handing over to you, if you can just a little bit more about yourself, your background, how you got involved as being a vet, et cetera, et cetera. Great, Carla. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. And it's always great chatting to you. And uh, you know, I feel like you always put me and Joel on a, on a pedestal. Meanwhile, we just actually average Joe's doing, doing, doing field work for uh, guys like yourself and Michelle and all of that. Um, so, hey, everyone. Uh, I don't know. Uh, let me just open the chat here so I can see what everyone's saying. But my name's Ben. Um, I'm a veterinarian from South Africa. I qualified in 2015. Um, and then I've always really wanted to do wildlife. Um, and then I was very fortunate about a few years ago to land in the hands of Dr. Quibus Roth. Um, he's a phenomenal human being. Kola, I think you've met him. Yes. You know Dr. Quibus very well. And yeah, he just, um, under his guidance, he's, he's uh, uh, taken me and Joel to where we are now today. We opened our practice um, last year, September, me and Joel, and yeah, we've just been growing in leaps and bounds since then. Eh? Um, so yeah, that's pretty much, I like to keep them short and sweet, but yeah, that's pretty much my intro. 
Okay, cool. So, um, Ben, I've done a little, um, you sent me some pictures. So, I've, I'm just going to see if we can share this with everyone. Um, hopefully, it'll work. Oh, here we go. Go back to me. Oh. Okay. Oh, uh, I thought maybe you could just chat to us as we go through the pictures and just tell us about the certain, you know, challenges that you've got to deal with on a daily basis with obviously human wildlife conflict and you know, desnaring and, you know, obviously then the rhino horning. Um, so I thought maybe if you could just chat to us about some of the field work that you've done. I know that you had a huge day yesterday. Maybe if you can just chat to everyone and just let them know what you were doing yesterday. Mm. No, for sure, Carla. Yes, you are. The rhinos have kept us busy, eh? Um, and uh, we're very fortunate here in the low felt that we still have uh, a very healthy population of rhino, uh, both black and white. But uh, since, you know, since I started working um, uh, in my career, I started in KZN, uh, which also has very healthy populations of both black and white rhino. Uh, but it's been, it's, been, it's been an onslaught. Eh? And I mean, the rhino poaching started a few years ago uh, and it just hasn't abated. Eh? And, 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 and our area hasn't been spared. So um, we've, been, we've been very busy the last few years with dehorning animals. And, you know, dehorning is just one of the tools in the toolbox um, that, that us as veterinarians use to, to manage these populations of animals. Um, and, and unfortunately, there's not really any scientific evidence uh, uh, backing it. Uh, there is a lot of anecdotal evidence, uh, and it does work. Um, but we, we're actually busy with uh, a lady now from the States, uh, Nicole Benjamin Fink. She actually wants to publish some uh, 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 data uh, on on rhino dehorning and and the, and the and the massive impact it has. But yeah, the rhinos, the rhinos, like I said, they've kept us busy. Eh? So we uh, and I mean every a lot of the people here are avid conservationists, whether you in Africa or outside of Africa. And I'm sure you follow the news and you follow the 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 dismal statistics that have been released by uh, uh, sand parks recently i mean they've just been absolutely hammered eh? and i mean to anyone who hasn't been to kruger you can understand why it's it's a huge area and it's it's extremely difficult to police you know so yeah uh, one of and the warning it's just it, it it just means that you you safeguard animals instead of having to constantly have guards uh, watching over these areas and and um, uh, preventing poachers entering. If you do own the animals, you just immediately uh, take the risk of that animal. You know, I mean, um, so it's it's really kept us busy. I think we've 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 dehorned uh, over the last two two and a half years, probably over three hundred rohano. Uh, sure. This year we've got another one hundred and fifty to do um and and it's 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 had a huge impact on the reserves we were working you know it's just taken and you can see it on the managers it's it's really uh, taken a lot of stress off them um and it's it stopped the poaching you know one of the reserves we worked on they were getting they were on a full moon getting three incursions a night and we dehorned their 18 started dehorning their 18 months ago i think they've had three incursions in those 18 months you know whereas compared to having three incursions a night so it's, it, it makes a huge difference. It unfortunately puts a lot of pressure on populations where there still are horns. Um, but with uh, some of the people we work with uh, in Kombi Rana, for example, Kola, I'm sure we'll get involved in some operations in future. Yeah, for sure. Um, we're planning on, we're planning on, on really uh, pushing, uh, pushing uh, the warning this year. Okay. So, uh so, and then what, what is the procedure? I mean, I know yesterday <laughs> you said you did 16 rhinos or something like that. I mean, do you have a ground, yes, you ground crew? Say again, Kola, you broke up there. No, I just said, do you, what is the procedure? Do you have like a ground crew and an air crew? Or how, how does the logistics yeah. go? Yeah, so on the reserves we work, there, there's generally quite big population. So we work with, uh, we generally work with two or three vets. Um, either myself or Joel, and we often work with Dr. Pete Rogers from Provet Animal Hospital or uh, Provet Wildlife Services here in town as well. Um, and it's, 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 a, it's, it's, it's a big operation and communication is key. You know, we, we work very in tandem with a fixed wing pilot. Um, so how, how it works essentially is it, we'll, get, uh, we'll get there in the morning and then um, we'll have Bruce McDonald. He's our fixed wing pilot. He'll go up in the air. 
and just fly grids on the reserve and just basically spot animals. And once the animal's been spotted, uh, one of the vets will go up with uh, the helicopter and the ground teams will position themselves close to the, where the animal's been seen or the group of animals, generally white rhino, as most people know, you'll find them in a crash. If it's a cow, she'll have a calf or a last two calves with her. Uh, even bulls, they often congregate in groups of two or three. Um, and then, uh, yeah, Doc, Arrow, uh, Doc Rogers will put an arrow, some arrows in the animals and uh, uh, the vets on the ground will respond. And we, uh, yeah, I think we, uh, we, we've done a few now to, to have a, quite a smooth operation. I mean, I think we can have a, a rhino deorned in, in, in about 20 minutes. Um, sure, that's quick. We, yeah, you know, and the method we use is a method designed by Dr. Pete, Pete Morkel and Mike Cock. Um, it's, uh, it's called the Cock and Morkel method of dehorning. We, 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 tri we, we, we do the initial cut on the horn uh, to take the, you know, the big mass off. And then we actually shape the horn to take as much horn off as physically possible without touching the growth plates. Okay. Um, uh, I don't know if you've got a picture or two of a dehorn rhino here just to show no, you. No, I haven't. Only really, the one yeah, on the left. We, we really take a lot of mass off those rhino. Um, there is still a bit of horn left on the stump, um, but it's not viable. Uh, the guys buying, you know, the in the market guys, they're not looking for that stump. They don't buy it. Um, and if they do, it's at a, a much reduced price. That doesn't make it worth it for the poachers um, to to start with. So, um, uh, you know, it's been, like I said, it's been a very effective method. Um, but, yeah, no. And then, yeah, so the entire procedure takes 20 minutes, uh, uh, 20, 30 minutes. And then we wake the animal up. And I promise you, five minutes later, they're grazing as if, yeah. as if nothing's happened. So. It's such a it's such a debate. I mean, it's such a hard thing. I mean, I always <coughs> am two minds about it because you're protecting the animal, but but you also mm. take away its its you know its beauty. So, but I mean, I suppose if it if it saves them for now, then it's you got to do what you got to do to protect every single rhino. Hundred percent. And you know the the horn on a rhino is actually. Uh, the only time it really, I mean, uh, they've got no natural predators. Uh, young calves maybe might be predated by lions um, and, and a hyena, especially if it's like a first calf uh, mother and, you know, she's not sure how to deal, deal with the situation. But, you know, a rhino horn is really, it's an archaic evolutionary uh, um, part of that animal that that's that, that it, it doesn't really serve much purpose ecologically and and in their day-to-day -day, uh going goings as a rhino you know okay. so removing that rhino horn doesn't really uh, affect the animals um it 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 there is a very small chance that it might affect uh, uh calf survivability um especially first calf heifers uh, and especially in black rhino but they generally just poor mothers from the, the get-go. You know, most of them lose their first calf anyway uh, to predation or, or, okay. or other reasons. But uh, a rhino without a horn is, uh, does just as well ecologically uh, as a rhino with a horn. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Um, yeah. so, so I thought maybe we could move on <laughs> to the, the challenges of, of, obviously, with the last year, you must have seen an increase in, in, in snaring work. And this is one of the ones that we wanted to try and see if we could raise a bit of money for you guys. Cause I know often you guys go out pro bono cause um, you know, these times are tough at the moment, but all these animals are, are being snared and, and yeah, maybe if you could just chat to us a little bit more about what's happening on the ground. No, thank you, Carla. That's very generous. Eh? And uh, let me tell you, it's, 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 you know, it's been difficult eh? since COVID's uh, uh, closed our borders um it's been difficult for every single human in this country it doesn't matter your background or your income level or whatever uh, and unfortunately we've got a very large uh, proportion of people that are unemployed um, and covid uh enlarged that and you know people just are sitting at home and they've got nothing to do you know uh, young young guys my age are sitting at home uh i mean they're destitute they've uh, uh with COVID, they don't have a future. So what do the guys do? They go out and they uh, spend the time in the bush, um, seeing what they can catch to take home and 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 and, and, and sell for uh, for a little bit of extra income. So snaring has become uh, it's increased exponentially um, over the last year, and uh, yeah, we deal with it on a weekly basis. So it's um, it's really gotten bad. I mean, I dealt with a, a wild dog last week. 
that she actually had evidence of having uh, of having had three snares on her, one around her mouth, oh, and then one over her front rant leg, and then she actually got caught with one over her hips, and it uh, completely degloving injury where it removed um, a lot of the skin over the top of her hips, and her, you know, her whole pelvis was almost exposed. <coughs> She's doing very well, by the way. After the treatment, we had a follow-up picture uh, on her today. Uh, but um, yeah, no, it's it's terrible. This hyena, I think this hyena had two snares on it. It had a neck snare and this foot snare. Um, and we believe these animals, this was a very uh, suspect location. Uh, we removed about snares of about 10 hyena over five or six months. And I think these, these, these poor animals were being targeted by witch doctors. But generally, it's uh, it's subsistence poaching, the snaring. It's it's guys who want um, guys are just looking for for extra protein or extra income, you know. Um, and it's rampant. It's everywhere. It's in Kruger. It's in the private reserves. It's in the communal areas. It's even yeah in town. Uh, we've re uh, Joel removed the snail off a war dog in the middle of town the other day. Uh, right. So yeah, it's a big problem, um, not just in South in South Africa, but in in the rest of Africa. It's a terrible, terrible. Uh, um, plague we're dealing with yeah and when when do you decide i mean do you make the call once you get to see how bad the animal is because i mean some of those snare wounds look hectic but then you mm. yes. I mean, and I wild animals but wild animals in general Carla, are phenomenal at how they can rebound and how they heal i mean this is a great picture this this, this was taken in mozambique this elephant uh, I remember we saw quite a few there, uh, old snaring injuries, and they heal up and they adapt, but, uh, 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 you know, just they go through an intense amount of pain and suffering. Um, uh, but but the, the wild dogs, yes, they, they fascinate me because they, they heal up like you cannot believe. Eh? They do terrible injuries on them, and they... Uh, often we try to do a follow-up. It's difficult with these uh, wild animals in big, in running around big areas, but... Uh, uh, they heal up very well if you can just take that inciting cause, you know, that snake cutting into them away. They heal up very well. And do you normally get, I mean, is it normally guys that are out on game drives that phone you to say that they've seen an animal with a snare? Or, I mean, is it mm. farm owners? or Very often, you are just general members of the public. Uh, we're lucky. And, you know, the other sad thing about COVID is when there's a lot of... Uh, uh, Pre-COVID, you know, there's a lot of game drives going on. Uh, so there's a lot of eyes in the felt picking these things up and, 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 and now they, we don't have that luxury anymore, you know, uh, but we're still picking up more than normal. So I can just only imagine, um, uh, once the tourism picks up again, that, that it's, it's, we're going to find a lot more animals that, that, that we've missed, but yeah, generally it's, it's Joe public that reports them, um, or the farm owner, uh, uh, uh or a guide at one of the reserves, uh, that will report them, um, but yeah, I mean, yes, when we did that, uh, that dog, that wild dog last week, we found a domestic dog and we actually, with a snare, running around with a snare on it. And the owner didn't even know. We managed to get hold of the owner and he eventually could take the snare off his dog. But uh, yeah, it's, it's to the point now where it's snaring, indiscriminately snaring livestock and, uh, and, and, and people's domestic animals. So. That's crazy. And yeah. um, I know that you and Joe are... <laughs> But out there with your your treatment, because I've seen him um, in the past couple of elephant collarings that we've done, where if there's been a wound, he's been using the the, the honey from elephants alive. Yes, yeah, Joel's a big fan of that. And uh, look, there's very good scientific scientific, scientific evidence that backs uh, honey as a, as a wound treatment. I mean, it's got very good antibacterial properties and and healing properties. Uh, so yeah, Joel Joel's a big advocate of that. I'm maybe a bit old school. I've got my <laughs> my regime that works for me. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, it's cause a lot of banter between the two of us because he's always <laughs> pushing me to use honey, and I'm always pushing him to use other things. But uh, antibiotics. Yeah, no, it works really well though. It does work really well. Honey. Oh, that's uh, cool. the, 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 yeah. Manuka and anyone out there, I mean, you can buy manuka honey from the pharmacies. You know, that's that's proper medical grade honey that that people use on wounds and ulcers and open sores, and it works really well. That's phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, and Ben, when I met you in 2017, I don't know if you can just touch on Matambu. I know he said he passed <coughs> today, but um, I know we, um, I don't know if you want to take over, but he was a very special bull and um, with his cataracts. I know that we tried to see if we could help him. 
Yes, this was a phenomenal animal, hey. And um, it's very interesting that Michelle picked up that there was something wrong with him. But for years, you know, he was a research animal and he was an extremely docile animal. And Michelle just couldn't, I remember her speaking to her and she said she just re couldn't really put a finger on him. Um, and, and then he was actually collared uh, before my time, Dr. Roth collared him. And he picked up an injury on his cornea during the collaring operation which actually subsequently healed. But um, Michelle decided in 2017 just to knock him down and we got a veterinary ophthalmologist in, uh, Dr. Isaac Fenter from the Johannesburg Animal Eye Hospital uh, to come in for the examination. And then the picture you'll see from Johan Marburg, a phenomenal uh, legend in the wildlife capture industry. He was, he was just helping us positioning the animal um, for the, the eye exam that day. Uh, so in this picture, yeah, we we had a look at the left eye, and we were just turning him over with a crane truck just to for Doctor Fenter to have a look at the the, the opposite eye. And um, you know, unfortunately, he he picked up a scleral injury. So the sclera sits at the back of the eye. It's the part that absorbs and reflects light um, uh, onto the optic nerve. But uh, he um, he picked up that there was a, a, a severe scleral injury to his, I can't remember if it was his left or right eye, uh, but it, 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 it basically meant he was blind in that eye. And then in his opposite eye, he actually had uh, cataracts, 80% cataracts. So he only had about 20% vision in one eye, but he still managed to go about his day to day. Hey? And, uh, and if anyone who, who, who's ever been in his presence, you know, if you drove past him in a vehicle and you'd stop uh, and you switch off and you just wait, he'd actually come meandering up to you and he'd stop at the vehicle and i'm sure you've experienced it Carla, where you yeah. just want to sniff you very curious a lovely animal yeah and shame you he passed away just the other day i remember michelle called me we're not sure we didn't do a post-mortem i don't think it was necessary it, it, was, it was a natural cause but um you know uh, i don't think it was age he wasn't that old um but it was you know we had we had our had our thoughts as to what what killed him but it was definitely natural uh, but okay. you're very sad but a phenomenal animal and he was a great great research animal for michelle i know you gave her uh, uh, a lot of great data yeah shame she loved him i think many of, mm. the, of the elephants alive guys <coughs> he included all love matambu <laughs> shame yeah he's very well known eh? and and yeah. not just with michelle and her team uh, a lot of the people in the apn on you very well a lot of the lodge owners and and landowners where he, 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 he walked. Um, and then Ben, maybe if you can just chat to us, I know you guys don't only do work in, in South Africa. I mean, 2019, we went to Kola up seven days drive from Durban, <laughs> went yeah. up to Jalais National Reserve, where I'm still debating if there were animals there because <laughs> they were so skittish. But maybe if you can chat to the guys about some of the work that you and Joel are doing across the borders. Yeah, so uh, Joel's been a bit more active than me lately. He's just come back from Nigeria. And I know he had a busy year last year. He was, uh, uh, he was up in Malawi and he was in Congo last year. And uh, he was in Tanzania as well. Uh, so yeah, the international work, it's, it's coming through more and more. Uh, but this was, a, this was a great operation. This is where you were with us, Carla. And yeah. uh, with Dr. Joel Maida there just uh, to the right of me. A uh, very good friend and, a, and a, a colleague of mine and a fantastic veterinarian. I mean, he's just doing phenomenal things in Mozambique. Eh? Um, but yeah, this was a, this was a coloring operation in, for a reserve called Jalay. And I'd love to just chat about Jalay for a few minutes because this to me is one of the untouched gems in Africa. Uh, and I know we went there and we didn't see a lot of animals. Uh, it's classified as moist Miombo woodland. Um, so unfortunately, it doesn't have... Uh, inherently there's, there's a low carrying capacity, but there are animals out and, I, and you'll see on your WhatsApp, I'll send you some pictures now. I don't know if you can put them up, uh, but uh, the animals are doing very well there. So um, the IGF, which is a French organization, they've been running the reserve for the last few years and they've got a lot of impetus in the last, since we've been there, a lot of impetus and they've been pushing a lot of money 
um, and resources into the reserve. I know they've doubled their ranger complement. They've got a radio system up now. They're working on their road network. Uh, they're catching poachers, left uh, meat poachers, subsistence poachers, which has been going on for decades there for years, but it's it's coming it's come to a grinding halt now. Um, but um, yeah, you know, it's it's uh, fantastic the work they're doing there. And this was a collaring operation we that, that Carla graciously helped us with. Um, we collared, I think it was four elephant on this operation. Yeah. It was very interesting to see that they actually spend uh, probably 50% of their time outside of the, outside of the reserve, uh, which, uh, which has also led them to protect. It's, it's part of a, it's a katara there next to the reserve where they actually spend a lot of their time. And it's, it's, it's led to them also being able to protect a bit more of that area. Um, and then, you know, in 2018, me and Joao, we did a capture where we took, uh, 15 Nyasa wildebeest and 50 crochet zebra from Nyasa uh, reserve to Gelee. And Ja actually sent me pictures in this week. Uh, the wildebeest have thrown beautiful calves. Uh, they found a lone harder beast, which they thought were extinct in the park. Um, and the zebra are doing well and the animals are doing very well. So uh, the buffalo herd is also full of calves. Um, so yeah, Gelee is growing in leaps and bounds. And I really hope... Um, uh, we can go back there one day, Carla. Um, Me too. Uh, um, <laughs> I'm know, ready. No, it was a, it's a phenomenal place. Eh? I mean, just that that Mjolnir woodland. It's it feels like you're in Europe. Eh? You remember? Yeah. It? Like it's yeah. just it's such tall woodland. It's we're so not used to it here in Southern Africa or in South Africa at least. Yeah. But uh, it's yeah. Uh, it's it's a crazy place. Eh? It was very cool. You know? Yeah. And and yeah. to and to find a bull like this, I mean, there's a phenomenal bull. I remember when we saw him out of the helicopter, we were just kind of flying back and yeah, we were looking for elephants and we couldn't find any. And it was like the third last day and there was a lot of pressure. And out of nowhere, we just flew over this bull in the middle of the Myomo. And, um, yeah, uh, very glad we got a collar on this chap. Uh, Sham, I remember he's got a, he's got, he's quite limp in his right leg. He, I mean, you can't see it nicely in this picture, but there's quite a bit, of, a lot of muscle atrophy in his right leg. Yeah. Uh, he must have an old injury. I don't know if it's a bullet wound or what, but, uh, uh, maybe old fighting wound, but uh, he's yeah, he's, uh, yeah uh, he's quite hunk of punk, uh, but he's still carrying on, and I think yeah, he's always with the ladies there. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, you follow that data that anchor puts up from um, from EA, but he's always with the ladies as well in their in their, in their, in their goings about of the reserve. But yeah, this was a very nice, very nice operation. I'm very glad uh, to be that we were part of this. That's very cool. I'd love to go up there again, just to see how it's changed in a couple of years. Um, it'll be interesting to see. Mm. Maybe one day yeah. we'll, we'll get in our vehicles and take a little drive when we can cross borders again. <laughs> oh, hopefully they've put barricades there so Michelle doesn't fall off the... <laughs> fall off the break her ankle. That, eh? <laughs> yes, yes, I do. Same, eh? And we had Marie yeah. Paul, uh, our vet from um, overseas that helped bandage her and yeah, shame, man. Yeah. It's quite an adventure yeah. and a wheelbarrow. We used the wheelbarrow to transport her around. <laughs> so. Alessandro with the logistics. Yeah, yeah exactly. Oh, shame. Yeah. Um, okay, so I've got a little video that I wanted to show you. This is just with Joel. Um, I hope the sound works. Um, it's just with us coloring elephants with Elephants Alive last year, just to show you. And then maybe you can just chat through some of the logistics of the air crew and the fact that you actually have to hang out helicopters and try and shoot straight, et cetera, et cetera. Oops.
There we go. Cool. So yeah, so that's some of the stuff we did <laughs> with you guys last year. Um, as I say, looking forward to doing getting our journeys with purpose up and running again, whereby people from all around the world can come join us and raise a bit of money for the important work that you guys are doing. So Ben, I don't know if you can just go quickly go through the logistics, and then I thought maybe if you could just chat to everyone. If they, I'm sure there are people out there that are wanting to know how they can get into this kind of industry, um, what the import, why it's important for us to have wildlife vets. Um, yeah. Yeah. So um, elephant coloring operations, they um, they uh, yes, some people might slate me, uh, but elephants are generally quite. Uh, quite easy animals to work with funny enough <laughs> um uh a lot yeah you, there's a lot more complex situations we deal with but yeah i still in saying that i love working with elephants they're phenomenal ele animals i think we still have a lot to learn about them and and and, and they can teach us a lot uh but your heli, heli operations uh generally you always want to be working with a helicopter as well um we've worked with elephants on the ground it's not ideal because they they can get spooked and run and then you can lose an elephant, believe it or not. Me and Jerry have actually uh, almost lost an elephant from the air before. Uh, lost sight of them. Uh, but yeah, they, um, they're very tolerant to the medication we use on them. They mobilization drugs. Um, uh, very high therapeutic range. Um, so the only thing really that you worry about is that uh, you don't want them to go down sternally. They, they, so they don't have pleura like we do. Uh, or a space between the, the lungs and the, the, the chest cavity. The, their lungs are actually attached to the chest cavity. So uh, when they're lying in a sternal position, um, they actually struggle to expand and open and uh, expand their lungs and to breathe. So you often uh, you want to get them in lateral recumbency on their side um, to assist their breathing quite quickly. Uh, but other than that, um, if it's on a nice flat surface, yeah, elephants are very easy to work with. Um, and yeah, we generally, uh, Michelle keeps us busy with the collarings down here. Um, I know other vets in the country are very involved in the movement of elephants. Uh, Kester Vickery with Conservation Solutions, he's, he's moving uh, a lot of elephants around, uh, um, uh, depopulating reserves that have too many and repopulating reserves that, that require elephant. So there are a lot of vets involved in the translocation of them. Uh, that obviously is a bit more of a technical uh, um, um, operation and then we also deal a lot with uh, snares and snares and general wounds uh, on ellies um, so yeah they keep us busy we we fortunate in the low felt here we've got uh, a, a big elephant population um, so yeah no they keep us quite busy uh, and now I've hit a blank because I can't remember uh, what um, if you can just tell us was. yeah well, you know I'm sure there's some people out there that might be interested in how to become a wildlife vet or I mean Erin was saying today that if she had known more about being a wildlife vet, it may, may have been the route that she had taken in her life plan. But um, yeah, so just, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, so uh, a, good, a good start. And there's, there's quite a lot of, because um, uh, I know, I think most of our audience is foreign. I don't know if there's any questions yet, Erin, but uh, you know, I would just suggest if, you, if you're really passionate about wildlife and you want to get involved, there's, there's, there's phenomenal scope in the wildlife industry. And it's not just, you know, me and Joel are very involved in field work. Uh, there's a lot of scope in, in the background work um, and very important work as well, like in, in, in clinical work, in research. Uh, you know, if you want to get involved in research, Dr. Quibus Rati is definitely the person to speak to. Um, uh, my old, uh, my old employer. He's a phenomenal human being, and he can. You'll learn a lot from him, and he's very involved in research. Uh, but if you're passionate, then uh, uh, you can make it happen. Eh? I would, I would, I would start by just trying to, yeah, coming through to Africa, uh, meeting guys like myself and Joel and Quibus and, and other vets and other people involved in conservation and people like Carla. Uh, and just see where you can get involved, eh? Um, we, we do run an internship program. We currently got an intern from the Netherlands with us. Um, and, you know, we've had a lot of interns. I've facilitated a lot of students with Quibus as well, uh, student training, uh, wildlife veterinary training. Um, but, yeah, I would suggest to maybe start uh, with uh, coming over for a holiday, seeing what it's like here, and maybe trying to do a veterinary course. There's quite a lot of veterinary courses with some really good vets uh, on offer in the country. 
and then take it from there. Eh? Just see see where your interest lies. It could be field work. It could be uh, laboratory work. It could be research. Um, uh, it could be you know studying uh, uh, um, um, veterinary and ecology relationships and, and and doing a master's on something like that, or studying okay. further in that field. So yeah, there's a lot of options, uh, but the easiest bottom line, I reckon, you yeah, come over for a course and see if you can't get in touch with some some local vets and see how they can't get you involved maybe in some way. Cool, excellent. Thanks so much. <laughs> Are you going to get an no problem. <laughs> CVs? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Aaron, yeah. I don't know if you want to take over. I know you've been monitoring some of the questions on the chat group and the Q&A. So I don't know if you... And then if oh. we from a couple of minutes and then we can all log off because we... Yeah. We're on time. Cool, man. Little so bit. I'll Little just kind of loop back to some of the questions that came um, up earlier while you were um, chatting, Ben, about the rhino dehorning. A um, mm. couple of people are asking at what age um, do you start dehorning these rhinos? And then do they need, do they need to be re-dehorned at a later stage? Mm. That's a very good question. So we often, you know, if we do a cow and she's got a cough, we'll immobilize the cough as well. Anything older than three months uh, or younger than three months, we generally leave the cow. Uh, we'll come back later, you know, once the calf's a bit older. Um, but from about six months, six to eight months of age, they do start developing a little bit of horn. We generally just tip it at that age, you know. So yeah, animals from about a year, you can actually start dehorning properly a year, year and a half. And then rhino horn grows at a rate of about a kg a year. Uh, depending on the size of the animal, obviously a general general cow will grow at about a, a kilogram a year. So we advocate that uh, we do follow up operations uh, every eighteen months. Okay. Um, yeah. If it falls into you know the right time of year, obviously the middle of summer is difficult with uh, uh, thick bush and temperatures. But uh, generally, every every eighteen months we have to redo on the animals. So it's a continual process. Okay. And how do you de how do you allocate? Is it just kind of like specific areas that you guys are operational in, or could it be over the border and someone's you know spotted a rhino with a massive horn, and then that becomes a priority? Um, so uh, we generally requested by the reserves that uh, uh, own own the animals, be it uh, and it's generally private reserves or, 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 or landowner partnerships. Um, obviously, Kruger Park have their own mandate to 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 deal on the sandbox animals and work with the sandbox animals. But generally, it's a reserve uh, that that contacts us and requests that we deal on their their population, and then they'll have a pretty good idea of how many animals they have. Okay, and so outside of like reserves and landowners and that, I've got a question here that came through from Jennifer. Um, she'd like to know, do you ever work with local communities to get their support or to do educational outreach? And then what would this process look like for your team if, if you are? Mm. We do. Hey, and that's, uh, we're all pushing very heavily on that because, you know, a lot of these people that live uh, communities um, that live on the edges of the reserve, some of them have never even seen a live rhino, you know. So uh, I know Michelle's got the, the Gogo program. For example, yeah. where if, if, if we do any work on elephant, uh, not just collarings, you know, but they just take uh, uh, some of the googles from the communities out um, just to uh, see elephants for the first time, and we've taken quite a lot of uh, quite a quite a lot of school students uh, on the awnings before. Uh, you know, it's phenomenal for those kids just to see and be able to touch yeah. a rhino. It's you know, it makes their yeah, I promise you. Um, and a lot of the a lot of the organisations we work with, I know I think we've done one or two with you, Carla, and with Nkombi. They often bring school kids from the communities, just uh, yeah. uh, because you know you've we've got to keep everyone happy. You know the people on the boundaries of the reserves, the landowners, uh, all all the all of them are stakeholders, and we've got to involve everyone in 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 in, in, in the in the management procedures we do. You know, I know yeah, that, um, that the bush. Oh, sorry, Aaron. Yeah. No, no worries. Carry on, calls. No, I was just saying, I know the bush babies, uh, the black mambas, I know they do a lot of uh, educational. I've given them quite a lot of our little wildlife educational booklets that um, Peter Eastwood from Tanglewood has very kindly donated over the last couple of years. And we're hoping to maybe do a few more this year. But it's so important to connect those kids with, with Absolutely. Uh, education and, you know, the as you say, taking them and oh. getting them to connect with nature. Um, it's very yeah. important. So, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, Erin, how are we looking on the questions? Because um yeah, yeah, I think one last question, which I think might be just quite an interesting one. You were talking about um, saying your well, your opinion is that the elephants are uh, one of the better animals to dart and get down on the ground. Um, another question coming in from Jacqueline. She wants to know what's the least stable animal to dart? Because no, you don't only work with elephants. Giraffe. <laughs> stable. So I've got very little experience with primates, so I'm terrified of if if I have to do a primate. Uh, and then white rhino are quite tricky, eh? Funny enough, they are. They they um, they, they they require quite uh, intensive monitoring uh, and um, and aesthetic uh, uh, procedures to to when we work with them. So white rhino are actually surprisingly very difficult animals to work with. But your mm -hmm. primates scare me. I'm terrified of primates because we don't do, do a lot of primates. <laughs> And like I've, I've I've been on an operation once with some chimps, and they, you know, those animals are highly dangerous. They eh? like they, oof, yeah, no, they scare me. Oh, and they, I don't know, they just look like humans. It's just not right. I don't think you should yeah. get human. I've always said they're like the gangsters of the bush. You can't trust them. You don't know what they're up to. And I'm just no thanks. Yeah. Straight up, oh. no. <laughs> oh, that's classic, man. Well, but, um, we do have a couple no. of questions coming through. I think just general questions about, um, I think, young and aspiring um, vets. So I think just because there are a couple of questions and we are a little bit limited on time now, we are obviously going to post this video up on our Facebook page. So I think if anybody wants to go drop any comments there um, or questions that maybe um, if you've got some time, I know you are very busy, Ben, um, to try to reply to, or we can always bomb them off to you in an email at some other points and try to give um, try to give our audience a little bit of feedback on that later but I think you did cover quite a bit of it in um, in your answer earlier yeah I've just sent my email here on the chat group if everyone's got some burning questions they're more than welcome to drop me or Joel an email Joel's on Instagram as well I'm not really too clued up for the Instagram I've got a handle but I don't really post much but Joel I think he's the conservation vet so you guys can go yeah. please go follow Joel he puts up some really fantastic stuff and he very exciting pictures there and you can just uh, send him a message on Instagram if you guys want to get in touch with us. Uh, otherwise, there's my e email. You can drop me a mail on Instagram as well. Um, uh, but yeah, there's my email as well. And yeah, you, know, you can put up my email there, Carla. If you guys got a burning question, please pop it through. We always yeah, keep cool. to educate. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much, Ben. I mean, as I say, I know you're very, very busy. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for the incredible work that you guys are doing out there. And it's always such an honor working with such professionals like yourself. And I can't wait to do more little fundraising expeditions where we can come and, you know, support the work that you're doing. So yeah, just thank you so much for your time. Erin, thank you so much for, for, for the questions and answers and all those things. Okay. And yeah, just really appreciate everything that you do, jo um, Ben and Joel work that you guys are doing so yeah. thanks so much carla very looking forward to having a cold beer with you when you're back up here in the low farm. yeah within may, <laughs> the may eh? <laughs> yeah we'll, we'll looking come forward to it. <laughs> cool but thank you to everyone that's um just tuned in for tonight for for listening for remy and kath i mean a couple of regulars peter eastwood everyone that have been you know peter. to quite a few yeah. of the wild webinars so it's just nice to know that people are out there wanting to learn wanting to support the work that you're doing. And if anyone does want to donate, we'll put a little link to our donation page. Um, if there's any specific project that they want to do, we can always help. As I say, I'm trying to collect a start a little slush fund for you guys for your de-snaring work. So yeah, any any donations will will be greatly appreciated to everyone out there. Mm -hmm. But yeah, also thanks to Kat Gill. From per She's done a beautiful little um, uh, I don't know if anyone's been following we every week we put up like a little fun games for the kids and little educationals so we'll post another one tomorrow and just yeah thank you to her for, for always supporting the, the the talks that we do but yeah thank you so much Ben and thank you Erin and thank you to everyone thanks Erin thanks Carla yeah. okay cheers eh bye thanks guys thanks for bye. tuning in <laughs>